can tell, we have a panel substitution and welcome Judge Davis on board in this case. Give me just a moment here. All right, so we're here on Doe versus Duane. Good morning, may it please the court. My name is Nicole Siegel from Burlington and Rockenbach. I'm here on behalf of the appellant, John Doe. With me at council table is Sheldon Stevens, who is trial counsel in the case. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. I wanted to point out one error in the brief, um, in our initial brief on page 30, before we started. Um, on page 35, we cited to a case called Doe versus Emerson. There were actually two different Doe versus, versus Emerson orders um, that were you know, discussed in the case. The one on page 35 of our brief was the wrong citation. It should be referencing um, the order which was attached to the defendant's motion for summary judgment at volume six of the record from pages 1031 to 1037. So I just wanted to clear that up and apologize if that caused any troubles. It confused me when I went to try to figure out what I was talking about. <laughs> um, the underlying case here, as you all know, stems from the sexual abuse of the plaintiff, John Doe, um, when he was from the ages of approximately 10 until 15 by a priest and a choir director. Um, the very disturbing allegations regarding the specific abuse is not particularly relevant to the issues here. What is relevant to the issues here is that the plaintiff brought claims against the Diocese of St. Petersburg and the Diocese of Venice based upon, in essence, negligent training, negligent retention, and negligent hiring of these two men. Um, the defendants moved for summary judgment, arguing that the statute of limitations barred plaintiff's claims because he brought them as an adult based on these claims when he was a child. Plaintiff argued that two doctrines should preclude the statute of limitations from barring his, his case, one being the delayed discovery doctrine and the other is equitable estoppel. The trial court ultimately found that neither uh, doctrine applied to the case and dismissed the case for entry summary judgment based on the statute of limitations. So I would like to discuss first the delayed discovery doctrine. It's plaintiff's position that the delayed discovery doc doctrine should delay accrual of the, the plaintiff's cause of action until he became aware that he suffered injury as a result of his abuse by the two men here. Now, the defendants have argued that the delayed discovery doctrine does not apply in negligence cases stemming from childhood sexual abuse, and that is one of the basis that the trial court um, entered summary judgment as to the late discovery doctrine. It is our position based on the case law that the plaintiff's claim of negligence would, uh, the delayed discovery doctrine would apply. Um, a little discussion about the history here and its application to sexual abuse cases. In 2000, the Florida Supreme Court issued the case of Herndon versus Graham, which was the first time that um, a Florida court applied the delayed discovery doctrine to a case of childhood sexual abuse. Now that case was an intentional tort case brought by a plaintiff who was abused by her stepfather as a child. And she alleged that she had um, forgotten about it until some later time after she was an adult. And the court ultimately determined that, now while that was an intentional tort case, there's nothing in that opinion which says that the doctrine would only apply to intentional tort cases based on sexual abuse. But there was the allegation of traumatic amnesia. There was, and I can- And the delayed discovery doctrine is on the idea that <clears throat> the cause of action doesn't even accrue until the individual is aware or should be aware of the cause of action. So if it's amnesia that causes you to not be aware of the cause of action, and you don't allege amnesia, whether it's intentional tort or not, how does the delay discovery doctrine apply when it goes to knowledge of accrual? We, our position is that the traumatic amnesia, while the case in Herndon was traumatic amnesia and the court does discuss and specifically indicate um, cases of traumatic amnesia, that Herndon still supports application of the discovery in this, doc, in this case. Um, what we have alleged here, um, we have not, and I agree, there are, there are no allegations, and we don't have any evidence that, we don't use the word amnesia, he never testifies to, to amnesia, our experts don't use that phrase. What we have here is that Doe testified that, he testified um, 
that several years out, soon after the abuse, one of the abusers was arrested, and there was a discussion about, well, why didn't you come forward during his deposition? Why didn't you come forward at that time? And he testifies, at that point, I'd quashed it and buried it down, um, the memories of the sexual assault. He thought it was, um, you know, he wasn't going to tell anyone at that point. We have presented the affidavit of Dr. Mayer, who's a psychiatrist, and Dr. Mayer testified that Doe developed a pattern of intense, unconscious psychological denial as his primary coping mechanism in order to deal with the abuse. This prevented him from discovering the causal connection between his lifelong mental problems and the sexual abuse. So it is our position that Herndon supports application in this case, and that is based on... Well, the the, the, the doc, that testimony, though, says it prevented him from discovering the relationship between his mental health issues and the abuse didn't say that it made him more such that he didn't realize he'd been abused and in this case it's not only just the abuse but it's the failure to supervise that goes to the abuse so the fact that he didn't equate his mental health conditions the measure of his damages to the cause of action doesn't necessarily mean that it he has not aware of the cause of action or does it? Well, that is, you're you're skipping right. I'm skipping right along here. Um, that is, <laughs> you know, I, Hamlet in the first act. <laughs> <laughs> um, we believe that the failure or the inability to make that causal connection um, between the abuse and the injury does again support the the application of the delayed discovery doctrine, and that is based on statutes and some of the case law, which I will go through right here. And I haven't discussed it yet, but it's obviously in the briefs and y'all know what the case is about. One of the statutes to relied on by the defendants is section 9511, subsection 7. And in that um, subsection, the legislature codified, essentially, the delayed discovery doctrine to intentional tort cases. Now, we don't believe that that applies here because we understand that applies to intentional tort cases. It also was enacted after um, the statute of limitations would have barred plaintiff's causes of action. But the language from that statute is helpful because it is discussed in, as a codification of the common law delayed discovery doctrine. And what it says is, an action founded on alleged abuse may be commenced at any time within four years from the time of the discovery by the injured party of both the injury and the causal relationship between the injury and the abuse. And so the use of, I think the connector and there between the injury and abuse indicates that there is some other injury other than the fact of abuse itself. And what the defendants have argued, and I think their position is, is that the abuse itself should have put him on notice. And he knew that at that point there was some damages. And they cite um, the case Christiani, which was a 1950s case where there was a car accident and um, he, the plaintiff knew that he was injured at that time, but later, you know, found out that he was going to go blind because of, you know, so his injuries were worse than what he had originally thought. Um, and, I, and I think that that case is distinguishable, and I think that the language from 9511 subsection 7 really makes clear that, that is, this is the delayed discovery doctrine um, applies to that causal connection, you know, or... or indicates that accrual occurs when that causal connection is made between the injury and the sexual well, abuse. Well, there's a distinction between notice of negligent act and notice of its consequences. If you look at the intentional torts and the professional malpractice, there's not a notice requirement, or there's a specific provision about notice, no, knew or should have known. Mm -hmm. In a negligence action under 9511 subsection 3, there's no, no knowledge requirement for a negligence action. Well, that we're, we're arguing that that the delay, common law delayed discovery doctrine applies and not the negligence. Well, then I have some questions about Herndon because as I reviewed Herndon, Herndon makes specific emphasis on, well, of course, this was also the reversal of an order on a motion to dismiss. It's not a summary judgment case. It's a little different posture. But also, they focus on the lack of memory. Traumatic amnesia. Herndon had a lack of memory. When she realized what had occurred to her, she filed suit. Then they go on and spend a, a lot of few pages on studies about traumatic amnesia, memory loss, repressed memory, hypnotically recovered memory, and uh, how they note that the legislature enumerated specific grounds for tolling the statute, because but did not include 
the discovery, delay discovery doctrine for delay due to lack of memory. Um, so there's a, a great emphasis on the lack of memory, but in this particular case, as I read his deposition, despite what the expert's affidavits opine, he did not appear to ever forget this. In his interrogatory answer in, in April of 2011, when he was asked about memory disorders, his response was, I don't know what you mean by a memory disorder. There are times I don't recall, but they are probably related to the use of alcohol and drugs. That's the closest that you get kind of to a repressed memory, but it doesn't seem like the memory is repressed due to trauma. It's due to him voluntarily getting intoxicated or an overdose. So where in here is there evidence in the record that he had a lack of memory because of the abuse? There is no specific evidence of lack of memory, and you are correct. And I will, it's not specifically on point, but I will point out that you pointed out his alcoholism, and he has, that was all brought on because he started drinking back when Ed McLaughlin would get him, you know, drunk and high. But that's being beside the point. I do think that um, Herndon did focus on memory loss because that was the case there. The plaintiff had alleged traumatic amnesia, but there is language in there. Um, which indicates that it would apply in a case, which we have here, which we have denial, um, and denial of the recognition. And I, the, the scholarly article, which is quoted in, in um, Herndon to support application of the delayed discovery doctrine in cases of childhood sexual abuse, and I'm just gonna read a quote here. Um, the classic psychological responses to incest trauma and numbing to incest trauma are numbing, denial, and amnesia. And then she goes on to say, many, if not most survivors of child sexual abuse develop amnesia that is so complete that they simply do not remember that they were abused, or they minimize or deny the effects of the abuse so completely that they cannot associate it with any latter consequences. And I think that that supports what we've argued here. He didn't have the ability, and I think what the de psychological denial and what our affidavits of our experts really make clear is that he just did not have the capability. He had pushed it down, he used the word quashed it down um, and pushed it away, but he, he was in denial about what had happened to him, so much that he could not come forward, and that's what our affidavits say, and I think that that is included in the language in Herndon, which the court relied on that entire article and discussion that they pulled out the entire quote to support their decision. Another thing in Herndon, or another discussion in Herndon that I think um, supports application here is that the court went into the reasons why the doctrine should apply in cases of childhood sexual abuse. And the court said, it is widely recognized that shock and confusion resultant from childhood molestation often coupled with authoritative adult demands and threats for secrecy, all of which we have here, may lead a child to deny or suppress, deny or suppress such abuse from his or her consciousness. And the doctrine is well established when applied and it would seem patently unfair to deny its use to victims <coughs> of a uniquely sinister form of, of, excuse me, of abuse. And so I think that that language also, when the court's talking about the purposes of why it should be applied here, also indicates that the court is open to denial um, of the abuse as, as another possible indication of when it, when it could be used. <clears throat> and again, this discussion really just makes clear that the court is focusing on the, the effect of the abuse on the victim. And the victim, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it was an intention, it's not the claim itself, whether it's an intentional tort or a negligence tort, the victim is suffering from the same same um, problems which keep him from being able to come forward regardless of whether it's an negligence claim or an intentional tort claim. So I hope that answered your question, Judge Sleep. That I, it does, I do but agree, but I think that we are still, it is still supported here to apply it in a negligence claim. And then going to what Judge Davis, you led into earlier, th or that it would apply in this case even though um, he does not allege traumatic amnesia. It does answer the question, and I think if you had Herndon alone, um, it may be a little more convincing, but we have Davis, which doesn't deal with the same cause of action, but yet the Supreme Court in Davis saw fit to address Herndon. And what they said, they decided, uh, 
a breach of fiduciary duty, that intentional tort discover, delayed discovery does not apply because it's not specified in the statute. And they said that we find the fifth DCA view to be better to hold otherwise would result in this court rewriting the statute. So if we reverse this case, are we rewriting 95.11.7 to include negligent causes of actions that result from childhood sexual abuse? No. The court in Herndon did not rely on subsection 7 to make its decision because it wasn't applicable, because it hadn't been enacted yet. So what the court in Herndon said is, actually the court in Herndon doesn't use it as a statutory endorsement. All they say is subsection 7 doesn't apply. We're finding that delayed discovery doctrine applies to this case even though we can't apply 95.11 subsection 7. We're using the common law doctrine here as opposed to the statutory doctrine. Now in Davis, the court said something which it did not say in Herndon is that it had considered 95.11 subsection 7 as a statutory endorsement for its decision, but again, its decision in Herndon wasn't founded on that subsection because that subsection clearly and expressly did not apply. They just said, oh, well, this is something that kind of helped boost our decision. I do not think that the court in Davis says that there has to be a statutory endorsement for application of the doctrine. Ms. Siegel, you're at the 15 minute mark. Oh, goodness. I'll briefly get into the estoppel argument for it, and then I'll try to save a couple of minutes here. If the court finds that delayed discovery does not apply, our position would be that our alternative argument is that the defendants are equitably estopped from relying on the statute of limitations. Our allegations of estoppel are based on Father Nick's comments or statements to John Doe when he told him about the abuse. Nick told him, asked him if he had told anyone, and then told him not to tell anyone about what had happened. We have presented the affidavit of Reverend Thomas Doyle, who testified that Nick's actions were consistent with the manner commonly used by the church to have victims to succumb to their pressure. This was a form of religious duress whereby victims were prevented from making claims for fear that they would sin and bring peril onto their souls. And he said that Nick's actions were consistent with that, and that the effect on Doe was the same. I'm out of time here, but the defendants have primarily argued that estoppel should not apply. They've raised several arguments, but one is that estoppel should not apply because, and the trial court actually found that Doe gave several reasons for not coming forward. But one thing that he did say is he testified, he was asked, why didn't you, did you go to anyone else after you told Father Nick? And he said, no, Father Nick told me not to. So he specifically said that he did not come forward at that time because Father Nick told him not to. Father Nick told him that it would, you know, his family would get kicked out of the church, and that he was also going to take care of it, which he never did. I don't know that there's any support for an indication or for a finding that there has to be only one reason why someone didn't come forward. There are always many reasons, especially in a case such as this, where there are probably lots of things going on, which may or may not have, you know, come into his head as far as why he wouldn't want to come forward. Excuse me. And unless there's any questions from the court, I will reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. You have about two and a half minutes. Okay, thank you. May it please the court, Matthew Belcastro, along with Robert Shearman, on behalf of Appleby, the Venice Diocese. The Appleby's would like to split our time, so if Your Honor would advise me at the ten minute mark, Mr. Radel, who is counsel for the St. Petersburg Diocese, would like to use the remainder of the time. I'd also like to start with the late discovery doctrine, because the briefs spend a good bit of time discussing legal theories for tolling or delaying the accrual of the statute of limitations, but actually spend very little time talking about which specific statute of limitations applies. And that's important. And if we look at 
the Dorsey case, uh, which is cited in the materials, um, it goes to a, a great deal of discussion about the applicable statute of limitations and finds, in, under facts that are basically identical to these, that the appropriate limitations period is found in 95.113, which deals with negligence claims, um, where things seem to get a little bit awkward in terms of, it's probably a poor choice of way of characterizing their claims, but in terms of the legal argument that the appellant is making, is that they want to take the accrual provision from 95.117, which is the intentional torts cause of action, and they want to move that over to the negligence statute of limitations period. So they want to say, we've got a negligence cause of action, but we want to use this accrual period here from 95.117. Um, there's no legal basis for doing that. Dorsey case, the Sinrod case, the very recent Cisco case, they all say 95.117 has no bearing on this type of a cause of action for negligence. All three of them specifically reject the 95.117 cause of action. Well, I think their argument is, is that delayed discovery should apply in this case because the same reasons for extending delayed discovery in Herndon apply here. Agreed. Agreed. Which I leaves them with Herndon. Arguments. Which leaves them with Herndon. Because you say have the same psychological effects, et cetera, et cetera, so why are we limiting into intentional torts? and not negligent causes of action. Okay, I agree. That's, that's basically all they have left in light of the fact that 95.117 can't be used. Um, so in, in response, I would say that we have such a long list of cases dealing with negligence claims. The Christiani case in particular, uh, specifically adopted in Dorsey, these cases say when you are aware that you have an injury as a result of tortious conduct, that's when the limitations period begins. But if you, if you buy the language of the psychologist that this person is not aware, what does it matter whether it's a tort or negligence or anything else if you're not aware? Right. But that's so, the very point that, that Cristiani makes and says, um, I'm not sure if Your Honor was challenging me or agreeing with well, me. No, but that's I, what the I don't understand. <laughs> if the issue is I am not aware of my cause of action, what does it matter what kind of cause of action it is? Well, I think the Florida legislature apparently So, I, So if I'm aware I have a tort, if I'm not aware I have a tort, I get a break. But if I'm not aware I have a negligence, I don't get a break. That appears to be the case. That appears to be the case. Apparently the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida legislature have in said- Davis? Did the Florida Supreme Court say that in Davis? In Davis, they in said. In Davis, they said, the 5th District distinguished Herndon from the other cases in dealing with the, uh, the non-intentional tort, where the defendant's wrongful conduct caused a mental condition which results in the plaintiff's delay in filing suit. Correct. It doesn't say delay in filing a tort action. But it, it says said delay in filing suit. If the defendant's conduct creates a condition in which the person is not aware of the cruel of cause of action, I don't see that limited into a tort. Who's the defendant in that case, though, Your Honor? The I don't think it matters. I think it says, it says, it says Herndon, and then they go ahead and say that the Fifth District rationale is a better rationale. And it seems to be saying that Herndon's rationale was, it happened to be a tort case. Well, let me ask you this. Is Herndon limited to only uh, traumatic amnesia cases? I believe so. I believe it is. Why is um, that? There have not been any cases. If you've got a doctor that says that this person may not have had amnesia, but was not aware of their cause of action because of other psychological reasons, that language in the Herndon case and in the treatise the Herndon case relied upon is not applicable? Let me give you the fourth DCA in Cisco instead of Matt Bel Castro on the law. The fourth DCA says we've had more than 10 years since Herndon came down. The legislature knows about Herndon. For whatever reason, whether it's appropriate or not, so, they chose not to extend so it. So even if Davis goes action. one way, Cisco, a district court, goes another way, well, I don't think and since 10 years has passed, obviously Davis is wrong. <laughs> He's been wrong before, I can assure you. Davis has. <laughs> <laughs> no relation, I'm <laughs> um, The Davis versus Monaghan court does conclude that the Herndon case is limited to its facts. 
And the facts of that case. Okay, is the fact, are the facts sexual conduct? Are the facts intentional tort? Or are the facts traumatic amnesia? There are two facts that are distinctly different from our case. Well, okay, but I want to go back to what you understand that language where it says Herndon is limited to the facts. I want to know which facts do you understand that a court opinion to be referring to? That it has to be the fact of sexual and other traumatic amnesia? Or the fact that this was an intentional tort case? Or the fact that this resulted out of a sexual abuse setting? All three. Sexual abuse claims against the perpetrator. That is Herndon. Okay, where you have traumatic amnesia. So if Herndon is limited to the facts, then it's limited to cases arising out of sexual abuse in this type of situation. Sexual abuse of a minor. I agree. I agree. So if Herndon is limited to cases arising out of sexual abuse of a minor, and if, as Davis says, Herndon is doing this because we're talking about the conduct of a perpetrator that creates a mental condition that precludes the individual from being aware. It didn't say sexual amnesia. It didn't say amnesia. It just says precludes them from being aware. Why doesn't the delayed discovery doctrine apply then if you've got a doctor here that's saying that he wasn't aware because of the repression and the denial? Why isn't that a factual issue to let the jury have? I'll give you two things. First of all, our defendants, the ones that are involved here, did not create the condition. Okay, that's what the language says from the Davis v. Monaghan case. We didn't create this condition. They're suing us based on negligent supervision effectively. All right, so when you've got a defendant, a perpetrator of sexual abuse that creates this condition, the Supreme Court in Herndon says, well, that's a compelling reason that we are going to find the delayed discovery doctrine applies. The fact that the agent of the church, non-perpetrator, says don't tell anybody, I'll take care of it, and then doesn't do anything, comes back later and says, did you tell anybody? No, or don't tell anybody. That doesn't create some psychological situations, that child that says, man, even the people that I trust don't help me? Not such that the legislature has recognized a basis to extend the discovery. Isn't that what the doctor said? Isn't that what the doctor's opinion was here, that this child had been such that he had thought nobody would help him? He said that he failed to recognize a causal connection. That is not sufficient. That is not sufficient under Herndon. It's not sufficient under the statutory basis for statute of limitations. It's not sufficient under Herndon because although it is coming out of a sexual abuse setting and there is opinion that he does not recognize the accrual of the cause of action, but it's not sufficient under Herndon. Correct. We have a plaintiff in this case who in 1991, he's at the age of majority. He has a conversation with his parents. They say, did he do anything to you? No, I didn't. No, he did not. Okay, well, in deposition, well, why didn't you say, why didn't you say something at that point in time? I didn't want my dad to go beat him up. He was going to get his in jail. All right, I didn't want this to be publicly known. He's aware at that point in time. Okay, these facts are inescapable. He's aware at that point in time, not just of the conduct, but of the significance of it. My dad's going to go beat him up. He's going to get his in jail. All right, these facts are stuck in the record. They can't get around that fact. So whether there were additional psychological trauma associated with it, I don't know. But what the Florida legislature and the Herndon court have said to us is we've got traumatic amnesia. Under those facts, we'll delay the running of the statute of limitations. Well, let me ask you the hypothetical. This is not this case. If all we had was the psychiatrist or the psychologist's testimony and you didn't have these statements about he's going to go beat my dad, that type of thing, would it have applied then? In other words, what I'm asking is, is it his testimony that trumps the psychological testimony? Or would it never apply either way? I think his testimony takes us out of the realm of possibility. The fact of the matter is we have hundreds of years of jurisprudence that say in a negligence cause of action, once you're aware that you're injured, it doesn't matter if you don't know the full extent. That day, the statute of limitations runs. And you can even look in the Herndon case, the court says that they're talking about that there are statutorily enumerated grounds for tolling the limitations period. And the court says, well, 
we know that this isn't one of the tolling mechanisms, so we have to, I'm not going to say they sort of, you know, figured out a way around it, but they did. They said, listen, this isn't a tolling. This is an accrual issue. Right. So the court says that we're going to let the statute of limitations accrue at this point in time when the plaintiff becomes aware of it. So I think that amnesia aspect is absolutely critical, not the causal connection. I think I've taken up more than my time. Do you remember um, that, that time now? I have a question. Um, we took up your time. <laughs> Alternate pleading cause of actions allowed. But are, is the delayed discovery doctrine, arguing the delayed discovery doctrine and arguing equitable estoppel, is that reconcilable? Yeah, because you have, we have evidence of, I never intended to tell anyone. I did not want to be a stigma in the neighborhood to be known as, um, you know, the young boy that was raped by someone. But also, we have someone who never forgot the abuse, which seems to be required in the de delayed discovery. So I think it is required in the delayed discovery. And in, in all candor, I think that the, the appellant's position is here, well, we didn't forget. Um, we just didn't know whether... The, the, the causal connection between the injuries and the and the abuse. So, I, I think there are lots of problems with with the equitable estoppel, and I, I'm and I think there's clearly a dif difficulty in reconciling. I forgot with I was misled. I don't know how you can say those two things at the same time, but I think they're trying to. I'm sorry, I didn't articulate that very well, but I think Mr. Radel does want to address that anyway. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Your Honors. Um, my name is Rob Radel, and uh, I have with me Andrew Labby from my office. May it please the court. We, we represent the, uh, the Diocese of uh, St. Petersburg in this case. Um, I'd like to begin, Your Honors, with uh, simply addressing a few of the facts that we think uh, are important from the perspective of the Diocese of St. Petersburg that haven't been brought out yet. We know, of course, that the alleged abuse uh, occurred between 1984 and 1987. Uh, we know that uh, Doe alleges that he told Father Nick about this alleged abuse. He said, uh, Father Ed is doing things to me around Christmas of 1984. Um, at the time that uh, Doe advised Father Nick, the problem was, of course, that uh, the Diocese of Venice was the employer of Father Nick, um, and he was no longer part of the Diocese of St. Petersburg. The two dioceses became separate entities in September, officially in October of 1984. They began in uh, September of uh, 1984. The Diocese of Venice took control of things, but by, as far as the records are concerned, in October of 1984, they became separate entities. That's uh, replete in the record. Uh, uh, Monsignor Mondu, uh, Muldoon testified to that, and it's also in our, uh, in our brief, Your Honor. The um, Doe, um, uh, I wanted to uh, talk a, a little bit about, first of all, about the um, equitable, I'm sorry, about the uh, delayed discovery doctrine. Um, the parties agree here that the statute of limitations is, is four years. That's the applicable statute we're talking about. Therefore, of course, unless there's some mechanism to either toll the uh, statute or delay its running, then, of course, the claims are barred. Um, Doe first attempts to circumvent the, uh, the statute of limitations by alleging this application of the delayed discovery doctrine. But the courts say that uh, statutes of limitations should receive liberal construction and ought not to be explained away. Uh, a cause of action for, uh, for sexual assault it occurs on the last day on which the, uh, the plaintiff could have been abused, and of course, we know that to have been 1987. So he waits for 23 years uh, to file his suit. It's not necessary, according to uh, the Miami v. Brooks case, it's not necessary for the accrual of a cause of action that a plaintiff know the full extent of his injuries or the full consequences of his injury. We know that the Florida legislature, of course, has limited application of delayed discovery to, uh, to certain cases. Um, in Davis, the Supreme Court clarified its holding in, in Herndon, but there are two other cases we haven't discussed. First of all, the Cisco case reiterated the Supreme Court statements in Herndon, and it held that uh, the case was, um, uh, the, the, the holding in that case was limited to the unique facts of those case, 
of that case. The unique facts of those case were it was um, childhood abuse coupled with traumatic amnesia, a complete forgetting of everything. Um, the problem is with amnesia, it's repressed memory. There's no recollection whatsoever. A lot of the cases that were discussed in our brief talk about uh, childhood amnesia, which is uh, known as infantile amnesia, and um, the child never had any recollection, never knew what was happening to him or her. The, uh, the fourth DCA also agreed with the Cisco case and the Doe v. Sinrod case. Um, failure to discover this causal connection between the sexual abuse and the resulting injury, it doesn't delay the accrual of the statute of limitations. That's in the Doe v. Dorsey case, as well as in the Doe v. Um, uh, St. Stephen's case. Doe's own testimony here contradicts any statements that he was unaware. Um, the statement that he couldn't connect the dots, well, he admitted that he was aware that one could go to jail for touching children the way he was touched. He admitted that he knew it was wrong. He was aware that his father could hurt Trepinski, and he believed that Trepinski, a pedophile, would not survive in prison. It's interesting that he uses the term pedophile because that shows an awareness that he knew this was a man that preferred children as sex objects. He knew that this is a man that would, quote, get his due in prison because he's a pedophile. He chose that language. No one suggested it to and him in his deposition. Correctly, that your position is even if delayed discovery applies, that the, the clock would have started in 1991 when he has the conversation with his father. That, that's correct, Judge Stillman. Uh, we, um, we feel that, uh, first of all, it doesn't apply, but argue, you know, for sake of argument, if it does apply, then his own uh, testimony would, would, uh, would say it couldn't possibly apply to him under these set of circumstances. I think Judge Davis asked the question earlier as to whether he is bound by that testimony when at least arguably, Dr. Mayer seems to conflict with the testimony. Dr. Mayer seems to say that the damage was such that he was incapable of going forward. Well, again, you, you, can't, um, you can't have a plaintiff that testifies one way and then comes back with an affidavit and tries to, to say, that's not what I said. Here what we have is at the last minute they filed these three affidavits. So, so your answer to my question is that even if the expert says that the plaintiff is bound by his own testimony? I, I believe so, Your Honor. Is there any authority that addresses that kind of conflict? I, I don't have that other than to say that, again, a plaintiff cannot uh, dispute his own testimony. So why would a doctor in an affidavit just before uh, the argument on the hearing, uh, uh, argument at the hearing for a motion for summary judgment. I think in your typical did. auto accident case, that makes perfect sense. Here we have psychological, traumatic psychological injury, which Herndon seems to address in the context of amnesia. But at the same time, I'm not sure that the analysis applies from an auto accident case where the plaintiff says, no, I really wasn't hurt. And then there's a doctor who says, the plaintiff was hurt really badly. Well, the Doe uh, Do v. Uh, Dorsey case, uh, Judge Silverman, says, as you know, that um, a child abuse as a matter of law is an injury. Child abuse as a matter of law is actionable. So he certainly knew he was being abused. But, but Dr. Mayer's testimony or his affidavit seems to be that the plaintiff was incapable of going forward until he actually did years and years later. Yeah, I, I, you know, Dr. Mayer, unfortunately, didn't do anything except review records um, years that's, and years that's a later. That's jury argument. Right. But for our purposes, right. the legal issue is you have a doctor who says he couldn't go forward. Does that, it, why isn't that sufficient to create an issue of fact? I think because it directly contradicts what, uh, what the uh, plaintiff himself testified to, uh, what he was thinking at the time 23 years before when he um, didn't answer his parents' direct question of why he he, um, uh, you know, whether or not he was abused. He denied it. He had the opportunity then, and he testified to us that there were various reasons why he denied it. None of those were because I forgot about the abuse. And in fact, his own counsel well, stood it, up. It, and there, I agree, there's no testimony that he forgot about it. And I don't even think Dr. Mayer suggests it in that way. He seems to characterize it more along the lines of he could, because of the nature of the injury, 
he simply couldn't come forward. He was, he was incapable of pursuing his legal remedies. I, I, to, I put it, to put it crassly, if you abuse somebody psychologically such that they can't psychologically pursue their action, you win. Well, and I, I, that I think would be the problem. Um, that would occur in every single case. But there are several cases which we cited that uh, talk about various Every single case you're gonna have a psychologist come in and say that. You, you possibly could, you could. And, and uh, so because